Hello again. I'm happy to present the second paper in our March meeting paper series presented this evening. Our next presenter is Sabrina Mora. She is a curator, researcher, and writer. She has conceived and organized seminars, public programs presented by a number of institutions in Brazil. She is currently the development director at Vasto, a Sao Paulo based the agency focused on the research and development of interdisciplinary projects in the fields of education, culture, and visual arts. She served as a visiting researcher at, at the Institute of African Studies at Columbia University, New York, with a grant from the Getty Foundation Los Angeles in 2016. She edited, a Southern, she edited Southern Panoramas, Perspectives for Other Geographies of Thought in 2015, which presents cultural and artistic, artistic perspectives on the concept of the Global South. Mora was recently awarded the Visual Arts Prize from Cultural Action Program of the Sao Paulo State for the exhibition project, Archaeology and Creation. We will be taking questions from the audience in the final five minutes. Simultaneous translation to Arabic is available in the chat box. I would like to, to now invite Sabrina to present her paper. Hello, Nora. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Thanks, everyone, uh, for being here uh, this afternoon in Brazil and evening um, in Sharjah. So I will start sharing my screen with you um, because I've prepared um, some images for us uh, tonight. Um, okay. So there we go. I hope you can now see on full screen uh, mode. So the title of my presentation is On the Verge of Now, and I'm going to address today what I'm calling the crisis of the future and the urgencies of the present in contemporary art biennials. And I'm going to start uh, with a very personal account, and you will understand later in my presentation why uh, I have chosen to start like this. So um, as a child in the 80s and the 90s, I grew up hearing that Brazil was the country of the future. Throughout that period, some moments of its political and economic history mingled with my affected memory. I vividly recall the televised funeral of Tancredo Neves, the first civilian president after two decades of military dictatorship who passed away in 1985, just before taking office. I remember the endless queues in front of supermarket entrance gates, where I used to go with my mother at the first sign of emptying shelves due to hyperinflation. I also remember the first democratic poll and the subsequent impeachment of the president chosen by these same elections, and the images of escalating urban violence in local newspapers. In the midst of these events, among my family members, my school teachers, and the mainstream media, there was a tenuous thread guiding us through our failures as well as our hopes. It was the myth that the country, in its continental dimensions, already had everything that a nation would need. Abundant forests, natural resources, cordial people, and that land would certainly succeed in its manifest destiny. After all, let's be reasonable. If we were the country of the future, we would never be adrift in our project of nation. Well, one fine day, the future arrived. I was already an adult, living in France, working with visual arts, and it was Christmas Eve of 2009. When I returned home from doing the laundry, I came across an ad in which the journal, the French newspaper, Le Monde, had named Lula the man of the year. Uh, quote, it seemed to us by his singular career as a former trade unionist, by his success as the head of the country as complex as Brazil, by his concern for economic development, the fight against inequality and the protection of environment, Lula had well deserved the world." End quote. This was a statement uh, in tribute to the former president presented by the French newspaper. 
It seemed almost unbelievable that a working class man who was bluntly despised by the local elites would take on such an international leadership status. That same week, while taking on, talking on the phone with my Brazilian friends, the news was that we truly appeared to be undergoing a period of prosperity. Five years later, I was already back in, in the country working as a curator in Sao Paulo and the year was 2014 and the soccer World Cup was happening in Brazil. While part of the world turned its, eye on, its eyes on us. The 31st Sao Paulo Biennial was precisely organized in this context and I took part in it with a group of young curators selected for a workshop dedicated to examining the role of curatorship in history writing. In the course of these gatherings, I recall us discussing the experience of this announced future and what we sensed then was its failure. As months and years passed, we witnessed the erosion of our fragile democratic institutions, the emergence of polarized debates, the growth of the far right, guided by the morality of religious fundamentalism, and their historical continuity of racial and gender inequalities. The future didn't last long. And what is left of the future? I'm sorry, what is left of the present when the future is shattered? The answer to this question doesn't suggest anything new to the historiographical debates of the last decades. Rather, it indicates a crossroads of expectations and temporalities. As a matter of fact, I should point out here that the maxim that introduced me to a certain sense of Brazilian history refers to the title of a book called Brazil, Land of the Future. Written in 1941 by the writer Stefan Zweig. Zweig was an Austrian Jew who arrived in Brazil with his wife, Charlotte, in the early 40s fleeing the escalation of Nazism in Europe. In his writings, the author weaves an idyllic vision of the country as the antithesis of the old, old world ravaged by the war. While opposing the two landscapes, Zweig affirmed his desire to move away for a while from a world that was being destroyed to a world that was being peacefully and creatively built. These are, these are Zweig's words. Unfortunately, this optimism wouldn't last long. On February 22nd of 1942, Stefan and Charlotte Zweig committed suicide at their Petropolis home in Rio de Janeiro. If the brief personal account introducing this presentation seems to say little about the subject of the March meeting conversations, it demarcates a specific understanding of time in relation to its narrative structures. For as French historian François Hartog argues, the crisis of the future accounts for the disenchantment of modernity and the disbelief in its ceaseless march towards progress. In post-war Europe, such a crisis seized the public arena while the memorialization of the Holocaust arose and the ideals of the communist revolution appeared to be shattered. As the historical subjects manifold, the rationale between past, present, and future suggested by Hartog no longer involves a sequence, but a not overlapping of temporalities in the now. The teleological nature of modernity goes hand in hand with the political discourses that sustain the continuum of traditions in national projects. Further examined by Lebanese scholar Tarek El Aris, the modern subjects are described as members of a national community that needs to rethink itself as having a particular origin, as having a particular present, and as seeking salvation in a particular future, such as the case of the nations emerging from decolonization, including Gamal Abdel Nasser Egypt. While associating Nasser's utopia with the narratives of modernity in the Arab Spring, 
Elaris additionally developed the concept and the expressions of the Narca. It was said that the promise of the future rooted in the modern experience has been abandoned for, for some time now. And it is precisely through the failure of modern temporality that François Artaud posits the concept of regimes of historicity, making the case for the emergence of a so-called presentist vision of time in the 20, 21st century. As opposed to a sense of history in which the future is seen as a promise and as a horizon of achievement, the contemporary present becomes a contradiction caught between amnesia and the urge not to forget. Overwhelming omnipresent, already passed before ever completely happening, such contemporaneity provides the framework through which to analyze the currencies of time as a curatorial contention in visual arts biennials assembled in the last few years. The relatively short span in between these shows argues for constantly renewed commitments to contemporary forms, contexts, and conditions, inscribing these platforms in a ceaseless cycle of actualization. Taking ex exhibitions inevitably embedded in the social, political, and economic agendas that allow their making, biennials are crucial to our crucial terrain to grasp the regimes of temporality behind the visual narratives of our time. In the following section, I take this rationale to explore the relations between artworks, curatorial discourses, and the motors for writing the past, present, and future in three very recent biennials. The 31st Sao Paulo Biennial, which happened in 2014, the 20th Sydney Biennial, which happened in 2016, and the 14th Charja Biennial, which happened two years ago in 2019. So let's go back to Sao Paulo for a moment. We are in 2014, and the 31st edition of the Biennial is open. As soon as we enter the modernist pavilion, at the Ibirapuera Park, it is possible to see a huge panel covering th the three floors of the building designed in the 50s by Oscar Niemeyer. Entitled Dark Clouds of the Future, the work conceived by artist Prakal Pashput remembers the Eldorado dos Carajás massacre that took place in 1996 in the northern region of Brazil. In the incident, 19 landless demonstrators died in confrontation with the police. In the first segment of Dark Clouds of the Future, we could see the 19 landless peasants looking up towards a future that unfortunately turns out to be as somber as we climb the building's winding ramps. Traveling along the three segments of the work, past, present, and future, the trunk of a Brazil nut tree, an Amazonian species at risk of extinction, emerges on the top floor with its crown severed. In fact, this tree is a symbol of, well, just a second, of the Carajás massacre. The Brazil nut tree is the source of a memorial composed of trunks placed at the axis of the highway surrounding the incident site. In addition to honoring the victims of the massacre, the memorial remembers the El Dorado Monument, erected in September 1996 and destroyed by local landowners just 15 days after being inaugurated. Notably, the monument, in the shape of a four meter high plowshare and inscribed with the phrase, the land is also ours, had also been designed by Nehemiah like the biennial pavilion itself. The memory surrounding Carajás was not, however, the only land dispute that influenced the public debate during that Sao Paulo biennial. A year before its opening, in 2013, a series of demonstrations opposing the constitutional amendments that modified indigenous land demarcation in Brazil gained widespread media attention. At that time, a red inkjet that was the, the image of um, Nehemiah's uh, monument. It's a drawing by himself. So 
At that time, a red inkjet alluding the, to bloodshed was poured over the iconic Monumento as Bandeiras in Sao Paulo. Built in 1953, based on a project by Italian-Brazilian sculptor Victor Brecheret, the sculpture occupies an area a few meters away from the architectural complex that houses the biennial building. Its symbolism pays homage to the violent colonizing expeditions known as Bandeiras that from 17th century onwards set out for the Brazilian hinterland in search of minerals and black and indigenous workforce. If monumentality seizes the public space against the impermanence of memory, the monument resonates the winners of history, a term coined by Walter Benjamin in the 40s, bequeathing a particular vision of the past to collective memory. For some time now, however, monumentality has been rejected in its univocal and authoritarian nature, while other processes of memorialization have been established. Examples include memorials conceived to challenge the praise of the individual, making room for collective experiences of remembrance. Such spaces are guided by materialities of another type and their symbolisms are inscribed in the political potential of a memory that is constantly being recast. This is the premise of the memorial for our country, which was conceived by Australian artist Daniel Boyd in 2019 to mark the presence of Aboriginal peoples in Australia's War of Resistance. Part of the Australian War Memorial Sculpture Garden in Canberra, the war consists of a semicircle made of balsatic stone that shelters a secluded space mirrored by a multitude of lenses, encouraging viewers to take a moment of introspection on the indigenous experience of war. The use of small reflective circles in Boyd's works draw, draws upon some of his earlier pieces, such as What Remains, specially created for the so-called in-between spaces of the 20th edition of the Biennial of Sydney. Curated by German Stephanie Rosenthal, the edition of the Sydney Biennial in 2016 made reference to the quote attributed to cyberpunk writer William Gibson, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Understood nonetheless in terms of sci-fi imagination and technological achievements, the future was only partially celebrated in the framework of the exhibition. According to science fiction amateurs, Gibson is said to have coined the term cyberspace, to describe constellations of data in human minds. A consensual hallucination, quote, experienced by daily, by billions of legitimate operators in every nation, unthinkable complexity, end quote, by Gibson. In this vein, however, the dystopian horizon of high-tech future imagined by the author refuses to fall into the traps of nihilism. Indeed, shortly after the advent of Occupy Wall Street in 2011 and the so-called Arab Spring, Gibson argued that human social change is more directly driven by technology than ideology. But I ask, wouldn't the World Wide Web be a junction of technology and ideology leading to a new type of politics? Here is where Gibson's idea of data constellations collide with the modernity constellation elaborated by Tarek El Aris in his speech at the 2019 March meeting. On that occasion, he discussed the fragility and the radicality of self-exposure self in the virtual world, as opposed to the secluded intimacy of the modern subject. He described the cyberspace as the glass house where no one enters no one who enters is safe. In the wide ecosystem of the cyberspace, we could also point to the tight, tighter clusters, such as the eco chambers and the algorithm filtered bubbles, which create biased environments where users only view perspectives that are similar to their own. Leaving the eco chamber, 
the theme that guided the 14th edition of the Sharjah Biennial sought to intercross a series of provocations on how one might renegotiate the shape form and function of this chamber in order to move towards a multiplying of the echoes within. But which spaces and social dynamics generate echo chambers? Do these chambers lead to polarization or do they facilitate political participation? Could they create a frame of protection against the superexposure and the fragility of the glass house evoked by Elaris? With the rise of the global pandemic, and the necessity of social distancing. These questions are à l'ordre du jour, but far from being answers. One thing seems clear though, the acceleration of time has not subsided at times of tense stillness. On the contrary, information, communication, deadlines and necessities follow the speed of optical fiber cables without even having to move our bodies from where they are now. As for biennials, if we look carefully into the histories of these platforms, it is possible to identify to what extent many of them were founded upon an idea of modernity and the desire to inscribe their home territories in an international global framework. This was the case of the Sao Paulo and the Sydney biennials. Others, such as the Johannesburg biennial, now extinct, and the Sharjah Biennial have expanded from a regional focus to an internationally oriented exhibition. In all of those cases, however, the inscription of contemporary art in the politics of the now asks for modes of exhibition making that seem to be moving away from the trope of globality that once oriented the field. Hence, while museums focus on their own collections and temporarily close their doors, Biennials sometimes cease to open them or, in a surprising turn, recast their programs and audiences to become increasingly local. While in the recent decades, many curators have moved through and along biennials around the world, they have carried agendas and modus operandi sometimes dislocated from local contentions. All along, curators and artists have promoted the circulation of criticality and have strengthened the links between arts and politics, largely informed by the poetics of traveling and time acceleration. However, the new dimension of space that we are now facing is not only rooted in the ubiquity of screens, screens and technology, but also in the sad episodes of environmental depredation that accelerate, acceler accelerate the long duration of the Earth's times and the dangers of the Anthropocene from whence we cannot escape. Ultimately, ultimately, moving to another city or country as Stefan Zweig did in the 40s does not grant us any protection, although neither has it assured the Austrian writer his will to live. Under this light, the demands for innovative projects and the search for the next trending and most likely to be financed topics in curatorial practice should be put in perspective. Quote, since modern capitalist societies reproduce their structure only through innovation and acceleration, we need to grow and innovate in order to preserve economic, social and political structures. This logic of economic stabilization therefore explains our lack of time, argues German sociologist Harmut Rosa. So what if we were to remove the veil of neutrality from the global contemporary in order to disclose its charge of specificity? What if we were to move beyond our own curatorial anxieties? I miss my pre-internet brain although I no longer remember my pre-internet brain, said writer Douglas, Douglas Copeland. It seems that now, more than ever, this feeling gains momentum in our longings. In times of artificial intelligence, the gaps of temporalities and the spectrum of no simultaneities are becoming increasingly distant, increasingly expanded. Thus, let's not forget what we were doing before the pandemic emerged. 
the politics of care and grief must be summed with the human need for presence and a careful look into history, without which we will not seize the present, neither the times to come. Okay, so I'll now stop sharing my screen. Okay, here I am. <laughs> Ah, oh, thank you. What alternative to ideals of the future does your research suggest? Uh, I think that um, the first thing is to sort of, um, you know, put in perspective uh, the, the idea of the future as a horizon of achievement, you know, the future as a uh, as a long uh, time frame or you know spectrum of temporality, um, because we have it, it seems that you know we have moved beyond the future, and what we found is past and present, you know, time repeating itself. So um, I think that. You know this utopian vision of the future of course has also has already been put into perspective but you know it's always in our longing so i think that us as curators uh have been dealing with this idea as i said of innovation you know as creating something new and um you know in the framework of institutional agendas you know that are always putting us um in face of the next trending topic and what we should be discussing now. Um, I think that we have to be very careful and very aware because this might become a trap, you know, if we don't look carefully into history. So uh, to give you a concrete example, I'd say, I would say that, you know, um, this idea of social distancing and the need for social distancing as opposed to presence also needs to be put in perspective, you know, and, the, and what we are living now, you know, the way we have been living now online and through distance. Another question from Zane Eswad. I thank you for, for your presentation and asking, is it possible for Seth, so for Seth, is it possible to separate concepts of progress and the future? I think that most Modernity is deeply anchored in that um, perception of future, right? Uh, and although historiography has already put that into question, uh, I think that uh, maybe we will always be um, looking into the future with that. But I'd say that it's, uh, it's inevitable inevitable, but at the same time not, because um, if we look also into history, there were other perceptions of future, right? Such as the ap apocalyptical future in the uh, Middle Ages. So I think that um, through history, there have been other perceptions of future. If we as a contemporary society are, going, are able to put that into a uh, critical perspective, this is the challenge, I think. And this is the challenge that we are facing now. Okay, so we have one more minute for one last question from Basil Haddad. Can you speak more to how collective memory or national myths affect visions for the future? Well, I say that national projects are deeply anchored in this, uh, these visions of future, right? Because they have to sort of cast the nation in order to embrace a common project. And this project is sometimes a fiction, sometimes it's a, it's a creation. So it, it is a narrative with a sense of marching towards something. So um, again, the question would be, uh, sorry, Nora, if, if you could repeat. Can you speak more to how collective memory or national myths affect visions for the future? 
Yeah, so I think that we are uh, also in this respect, if we think of, you know, collective memory as, a cha as challenging this official myth and national myth, I think that we are uh, seeing a moment of great opportunity because, you know, uh, historical subjects have, have taken the world, have taken the public arena. And of course, 2020 was uh, an emblematic year in that sense, not only um, in the US or, you know, in other countries, um, Europe, but also I'd say in Latin America, you know, where these uh, national myths have been put into, into question and have been challenged and, you know, um, we see the emergence and, and the fact that in the public discourse and in the mainstream media, this has become um, a point of no return. So, um, yeah, I think that we are we are facing a moment of opportunity in that sense. Thank you very much, Sabrina. And I'd like to thank the audience again for sending over questions and watching us today. We will reconvene in around eight minutes for our final presentation for the, for today. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you. Bye.